want to welcome our additional guests who have joined along with the regular class of cybersecurity law and policy, uh, which Professor Lee McKnight and I uh, co-teach. For our special guest today, Mr. Seem Alatalu, who is head of international relations for NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, which our students are somewhat familiar with because we've bumped into the Talon Manual already and seen some hmm. things um, from the website. Now, the first time I met him was just a couple of days ago, but he actually was at Syracuse before I was, being a 2005 graduate from uh, the Maxwell School. 06. 2006, 2006, yeah. Yeah. okay. Um, we should correct this, <laughs> thank you. Uh, he's also right now working on his PhD at the Talon University of Technology in public administration <laughs> and technology governance. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to him and there will be an opportunity for questions afterwards. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Professor. So good afternoon, everyone. Do you, do you hear me in the back as well? All right, so uh, as the professor mentioned, it's not my first time in Syracuse, or so I thought. So I arrived yesterday after 10 years, uh, and I uh, realized what a great uh, campus you have here. So it's really improved a lot. It's been a great school always. I've really enjoyed everything I learned here, but I uh, really admire it in its current uh, function, and I want to congratulate you on having made the right decision to come here. <laughs> So uh, my presentation will be about, let's say, 45 minutes. I will discuss uh, different issues. I'm representing an institution which is interdisciplinary. And so I heard that also the esteemed audience is interdisciplinary to some extent. So I'm uh, excited to also have your questions in, in the later parts of, uh, of the meeting today. Uh, so I will discuss shortly, give you an uh, overview to what, uh, what we work on in Tallinn. Also, also, the, with the focus on the international law part of our work, you mentioned the tally manual, so I will dive into it slightly, since you've already learned about it. And I will also discuss a upcoming product of ours in that field. And then, then I will turn to the issues at hand at NATO. Now, you will see in the title that I'm representing a NATO institution. It's uh, always important to distinguish between an audience of lawyers that the Euro we are not part of NATO. So the NATO CCD COE is actually an international military organization in, in its own right. It's set up by a memorandum of understanding between currently 19 countries. All right, so let's get down to business. Uh, now, I normally begin my presentations with this photo, just to give you an overview of where I'm coming from. Now, this photo is about 90 years old. Uh, so the CCDCOE, it's actually located in a very historic uh, part of Tallinn, Estonia, and is part of a military compound. But the, the, why I'm showing this photo is actually the, the, the other story. So you see the aircraft. Now, if you take yourselves a hundred years back to the times of the First World War, so uh, what was a new feature in warfare at the time was air warfare. So all of a sudden, you had death and destruction coming from skies. And individuals, but also nations, started there to discuss, do we need to have new norms, new regulations, new laws, new agreements in place to regulate this new type of warfare? Well, long story, story short, well, we don't have any special international agreements on air warfare other than other than the fact that the world has learned to live with it. So we've really accommodated ourselves to it. If you take ourselves back to the current age, uh, the same story happens with cyber. So again, individuals, lawyers, practitioners, academics, and countries are debating whether we need a new type of consensus for cyber warfare. So is it something that will bring us death and destruction? Is it something that we need new laws and regulations for? It remains to be seen. My gut feeling is that given the fact that nations are the ones who make the rules and uh, international law around the world, nations will have a tough time agreeing to something special. So again, I would, I would estimate that we need to accommodate ourselves and really cope with the new reality that is cyber warfare. So that was in, 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 in uh, very many words, uh, a short story long, uh, why this picture here. 
I would also mention that uh, when we give our presentations, we are requested actually by NATO to tell our audiences that uh, whatever we are telling you, this is not NATO policy. And the reason is what I told you earlier, we are a separate institution, we are not part of the NATO command structure. The good side of this disclaimer and this limitation is that sometimes whatever we tell our audiences will soon become NATO policy. And I have a, have a few examples to, to make the case later on. Now, when our center uh, stepped into the cyber defense arena, that was in 2008, well, in the middle of the last decade, this was what the Internet was really about. If you ask a normal people, what is cyber, what is cyber security, what is cyber defense, it all comes down to, to Internet. Internet connecting everything, that is both the opportunities and the threats and the challenges. And always there is a human component to it. So that, this was the map of Internet uh, in 2005. So as you can see, predominantly, with some exceptions, most of the users of Internet at the time were in the US and also in Europe. Fast forward 20 years, this is an estimate of the year 2025. You see that it will have changed fully. China alone has more users than US and Europe combined. So it's a totally new theater of, of operations. It's a new, totally new reality that we need to work with. And uh, just to show the same thing graphically, 2005, when we entered the arena, we entered 2008, but 2005 was when it really took off, with internet becoming a commodity in a mobile phone. And especially relevantly today, and after last Friday, the role of devices being connected to the internet, devices being online, and devices being uh, mani manipu manipulable. So the big thing is, and it's safe to say in two words, people are now IP addressable. So it's a, it's a new reality we need to live with. Also, as I mentioned, since the nations are the ones who make the rules, the nations are the ones who make uh, uh, international law, nations are really trying to cope with the situation. So here are a few numbers for your information about what they are doing about it. So they are implementing laws, national laws, which take into account uh, reality on the ground. That is the e-voting systems, uh, e-services provided by government, all sorts of things where you need to, refer, uh, where you need to uh, use internet to really keep your society going. Also countries around the world, over a quarter of the global population actually, is, uh, is having a national cybersecurity strategy in place. That is, there are guideline documents who, uh, who direct those nations forward. And the, how to say, the gray area of the same story is that uh, many countries also are in possession of cyber offensive capabilities. That is, they can use code to pursue their political goals vis-a-vis goals -vis other countries. And uh, the final number on the page is that uh, there's a growing number of cyber commands. So nations are knowingly actually having structures in place that really are able to, to, to use those capabilities. And nations are also getting engaged in this cyber warfare. Some, uh, some uh, years and cases for you to, to recall, well, in many uh, uh, presentations, it's said that the 2007 cyber attack against Estonia was the, basically the starter of the game. Well, I'm a modest Estonian, so I wouldn't take all the credit for this. Estonia just happened to be there in, in, at that time. But I would say there's more concern with the next cases where cyber was being uh, used aside to a military campaign against another nation, that was Georgia and where cyber and its capabilities were really used against na a nation in the case of Ukraine. Uh, I would say, although the, the war in Ukraine started in 2013, the critical case took place in December last year where actually people in Western Ukraine, so very far from the actual conflict zone, were left without uh, electricity uh, in the, in the I would say, 
the, the time of Christmas, so people uh, really had uh, really really had cold in a way. Lived without electricity in the middle of the winter. Quite a how to say a nasty strategy, which you might think of. And of course, there are the other cases of Sony hack, OPM hack, DNC hack, where there has been clear retribution that a particular country is behind those cases. Now, uh, if you want uh, more data, then these are just an excerpt from an article by the Wall Street Journal last year. So they actually had a survey conducted on this, uh, on this issue, and they, uh, they basically asked nations, uh, are you in possession of any of those things you see on the board? And these are the re results. So I would say it's, uh, it's quite telling, in short. Now, I've been speaking about cyber attacks, cyber warfare. So what about, what about the cyber, cyber weapons? So what am I actually talking about? And uh, just last weekend, we had a uh, conference organized in, in Washington, D.C., in, in cooperation with the Army Cyber Institute of the U.S. Military Academy. <coughs> and uh, one researcher actually provided with a very, very good definition, which I'm happy to quote here. So cyber weapon is basically a computer program which is created and or used to alter a damage, a ICT component of a system in order to achieve military objectives against adversaries inside or outside cyberspace. So as you can see, this, uh, this really tries to encompass it all. It's really a comprehensive definition for a, for a thing which actually could be just a few lines of code. So it's really multifunctional. And the same group of researchers, they, okay, now it's all right. Uh, they also provided some characteristics which should help you define and um, characterize what this code could be. So it's, uh, it's always built on purpose. So it's target spe specific. It's intangible. You might, unlike a, a conventional weapon, you cannot really take it into your hands. It's cheap. It can be configured, so it's purpose-made, but it, the purpose can be altered. Uh, you cannot reuse it. The, f the time you use your cyber weapon, uh, your secret is out, so next time you want to do something similar, you need to have a new cyber weapon in place. There is a violent nature involved, so a cyber weapon is used for a certain purpose which, needs, which aims at creating harm. Remember what I said about the case in Ukraine. And it can be defensive or offensive. So in order to, to actually be able to do credible cyber defense, you need to know the, the uh, principles of cyber offense and vice versa. So that's really the essence of a cyber weapon. All right, so what is then our role? This is the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence on the world map. So altogether 19 countries have sent their staff to Tallinn to, to tackle all those challenges that pertain to cyber defense, uh, cyber warfare in a cooperative manner. So a multinational staff coming from those countries and dealing with, um, dealing with a multitude of issues. I will have them on screen right away. The, m the mission of the center is to enhance NATO cyber defense. So that's stemming from the MOU I mentioned earlier and uh, it's very fairly, I would say, broad again. It uh, says we need to enhance NATO's cyber defense capability, cooperation, and information sharing. And you might wonder, so what's so special about it? Well, people share information all the time. They go on social media, they share, they like, they do whatever. So that's information sharing happening all the time. But this is not the case between countries. So from country to country, uh, they are all pretty secretive about their capabilities. For example, the case of cyber weapons and the uh, cyber offensive capability I showed you a couple of slides ago. Uh, yes, the numbers might be out there, but it doesn't mean that there is any kind of cooperation with between those countries. So in Tallinn, we're trying to make a case, and we are making the case that it is actually possible to cooperate between countries, like-minded countries who are allies and, uh, and partners to each other in cyber defense. 
How do we do it? We are not a operation unit, so we do not monitor any networks. We don't go after any bad guys. We do, don't do things like that. But we try to actually uh, stay one step ahead of those tasks. So uh, we are a research institution. We are a knowledge hub and we are a training center. We have a um, uh, technical research program, for example, where uh, techies, so people who know about bits and bytes, they try to solve uh, different technical uh, challenges, be it malware analysis or uh, forensics or any, any of that kinds of things. We also do research in uh, law, international law, of course, and we also uh, have a task to work on strategy. So we actually have three core areas, which are then the law and policy, international law essentially, technology and strategy. So what it really looks like on a daily basis is that, well, you see there is a uh, cyber problem. Then the techies are there to tell if anything can be achieved by technical means. They, they tell us what is possible by using code, computer, networks, your, uh, your IT skills. And then the strategy people take these and tell us what, these, what is what the nations would need in their own possession, <coughs> that is our nations, the 19 like-minded countries from uh, Europe and North America. And uh, when all this has been established, then the lawyers come in and they ruin everything. Say, they say that, you know, this is all very nice, but it's illegal. So uh, that, was a, that was a joke, but uh, <laughs> essentially, this is how it works out. Because, well, as I mentioned, there is no global consensus. What is then the new international law? Is there a new one? Or do we, do we uh, need to adapt old ones? old existing regulations uh, and what about the national law and that is sometimes the tricky part because what might be considered uh, legal in one judicial system might not be legal in another one so it's really different from country to country so as I mentioned we are a research hub we, are, we do give uh, lectures like this one here we support NATO, we have our own technical exercises program. We are the home of the Tallinn Manual and we have, a, uh, we have our own annual conference cycle. Now in the following slides I will briefly go over the Tallinn Manual. I'm sure you're well aware with it, but uh, nevertheless I always, I always um, uh, tell at least a few sentences which are about it right away. So it, it's a publication which came out in 2013, in, in January. Uh, and so when it came out, it was met with some uh, very big font headlines in the news, uh, newspapers saying that NATO says it's okay to kill the hacker. So flashy headlines, uh, great sales for the newspapers, uh, and some, I would say, uh, shocking moments at the NATO HQ who rushed to say that, well, this is a publication by the center in Tallinn, this is not NATO policy. For us, it meant that we needed to implement the disclaimer I showed you earlier. <laughs> but it's also one of the examples where the work we do and our experts who work on those, like Professor uh, Mike Schmidt for, Schmidt, for example, uh, uh, this is one of the examples where we actually uh, help NATO to come to policy conclusions and decisions. So one of the um, uh, recommendations or uh, one of the rules, as, as they are called, of the Tallinn Manual uh, later led on to NATO to, to establish that the uh, cyber attack an, against one country can lead to the invocation of the Article 5 decision of the Washington Treaty. So uh, the regulations that and the rules which are in the Tallinn Manual are, have been very helpful for NATO. Uh, of course, the question is still that nations around the world are not in a consensus about the same rules. So it's still a manual. It's not international law per se. But it helps the reader to, to understand uh, what is basically okay and what is not okay to be done in, in cyber in times of war. And this is important to distinguish that this is about the law of armed conflict, this manual. It's not the entire international law 
that is out there. And for that purpose, we are right now in the very last phase of uh, coming up with a new manu manual, which is called Italian 2.0, which will then expand the international law uh, for cyber uh, from, from war wartime to peacetime. Essentially, you see the uh, different uh, areas of law which the new manual will cover. The list is way longer than uh, for the first tally manual, but it's uh, at the same time uh, telling that it has taken uh, about altogether 10 years since the attacks against Estonia that we have s at least some sort of rules out there to which the experts, experts of international law, practitioners from around the world have managed to agree to. Now, given the fact that this manual and the rules will be out there, noting that they are still not the international law that the nations need to adhere to, here is a list of options for the countries to still, to still follow. So how would you address the incoming cyber attack from a, from a uh, legal perspective and also from a policy choice? So if you have something mild happening, of course, you can treat it as law enforcement. You catch a criminal, you know, sentence him or her, and end of story. The other extreme, on the other uh, red end, is that you can also engage in countermeasures. So once you have something happening, you don't waste any time. You do the same thing to your adversary. And just, uh, just this weekend, I read an interesting... Uh, uh, article, it may have been the, the New Yorker. The author was Thomas Reed, who depicted how, in the case of the DNC hack, how there has actually been a very quick exchange of, uh, let's, let's call it phishing with a PH, between the US and Russia. So uh, I would recommend it as a, as a reading for you, but it, uh, for me, it shows that uh, doing the same thing to your adversary or uh, whom you consider your adversary is actually a policy choice for nations in real life. One thing I didn't tell you earlier is that <coughs> although we have uh, planned for the questions in the later part, if there's anything you would like to know, I do encourage you to uh, ask questions right away as well. Okay, so uh, now having spoken about the law and the choices for countries and having noted that the countries are the ones who make the rules, let's uh, take ourselves to the new, new topic. That is the NATO's uh, new cyber domain challenge, as I would call it. Uh, you may be aware that uh, at its last summit in Warsaw this summer, NATO heads of state and government said that from now on, uh, cyber will be a operational domain for NATO. That means that uh, in addition to conventional warfare, that is air warfare, uh, land warfare, sea warfare, and uh, in some cases, debatedly, also space, uh, cyber is an area where NATO needs to get its act together and be ready to fight wars, essentially. This is not what the uh, heads of state said uh, exactly, but the idea is the same. And it wasn't the first time that they said anything on cyber. So actually at NATO, in a NATO context, cyber has been in the picture since 2002. That was the first post-9-11 summit NATO had. The graph depicts uh, a word count. So it uh, goes to symbolize the share of cyber has gained uh, in the summit declarations that are public documents. But in addition to public uh, agreements on things, of course, uh, NATO and nations between themselves, they discuss things in classified sessions as well. But I think it's an easy thing to remember that Warsaw was really a groundbreaking summit for cyber at NATO. And now NATO actually has a challenge, as I alluded to, to really figure out what and how it needs to do with this declaration. Uh, NATO has taken cyber on board also in the very, very, very highest uh, guiding document it has, the strategic concept. 
and that is in 2010 that they agreed to the following. So really, the in, sh in short, NATO needs to improve itself, improve itself in cyber. De uh, develop further the ability, prevent, detect, defend against, and recover from cyber attacks. Now, so far, this has not uh, had any, let's say, break breakthroughs to report on, but it's more, uh, even more clear that NATO really ne needs to get its act together. The same concept says that NATO has three core tasks. So as an alliance, that is over and above what the nations do. The nations of NATO, they need to cooperate to be ready to, in the worst case scenario, to do collective defense against the outside attack. They also need to engage in crisis management together. That is, for example, the peace building operations, uh, uh, operation in, in Afghanistan or Kosovo or or uh, other places, and also the cooperative security. That is the daily relations with countries who are not in NATO, but have a partnership agreement with them. So actually that, that pillar can uh, con cover uh, roughly one third of the uh, global community. It's roughly 70 nations or so. And the big problem why it's all red, so red normally means adversary in the NATO coloring scheme. So it's red and blue. Uh, so re red means that actually with cyber it's really hard to distinguish where you can um, move from one core task to another. There is no phasing over, there are no limitations. A minor, minor cyber attack can, uh, can become something that really triggers a Article 5 situation. Uh, NATO's decision is quite uh, ambiguous on, uh, and raises the obvious question. So what do you... What do you do with the Article 5? Uh, if, uh, if you have agreed that uh, in case of a cyber attack, NATO can engage collectively and do something about the situation, what exactly do you do? And what is the threshold? <coughs> what are the characteristics of the attack that uh, would really trigger NATO's <coughs> collective response? Uh, and uh, at NATO, they call it the what's a constructive ambiguity. So it's ambiguous on a purpose, and uh, I think it's quite prudent because in cyber defense and in the case of cyber uh, warfare, you you really don't know what can be the factor that will cause one nation to ask for its allies' help. Now, uh, NATO, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the context of the tally manual, there are some things where NATO has really taken the the work at the uh, CCDCOE on board. And NATO has had uh, a, uh, a cyber defense policy and later on a enhanced cyber defense policy approved. That is a defense minister's level agreement normally. And uh, in the context of international law, it's important to note, for example, that NATO recognized that international law applies in cyberspace. That goes, down, uh, goes back to the first tally manual and, and it really needs that the rules that countries have agreed to earlier, they will be accepted by NATO members, they will be followed by NATO members in the context of cyber conflicts. It's a political commitment, but it's, it's quite a telling one. The other uh, important declaration uh, uh, was, uh, for example, a previous summit declaration in, in from Wales. Uh, so that is the one I mentioned already, that a cyber attack can lead to a declaration of Article 5 and then follow the uh, ambiguity as to what exactly is meant. And this is then the most recent declaration from, uh, from Warsaw uh, pertaining to the uh, cyber becoming a domain of, op of operation for NATO. And now it's really the high time for NATO to understand and, uh, and do something because now as the heads of state and government, you cannot go any higher than that. I've agreed that we really need to do something about it. The question is really how. And uh, what makes it crucial for NATO to get its act together is really the speed of, 
uh, things happening. All the hacks I mentioned before, well, um, NATO nations are not immune to things coming from outside, from other countries, and all of those attacks have come from outside NATO. In, uh, in an easy case, it might be just in inconvenience for the normal member of a society. So, you know, you cannot access a, a uh, web shop or you cannot uh, do something which you're used to doing. You cannot access something on your, on your smartphone. But in the, in the other extreme, it can be that a uh, power plant is brought down and in a doomsday scenario, for example, a nuclear power plant or a, uh, even something more relevant in that regard is brought down by a cyber attack. And I think the example of, of last Friday, it's uh, really telling that uh, not enough uh, focus has been paid to the security of the, of the devices that we are using. Devices which go online, uh, which we like to be, which we like to have online, uh, but which will never tell us that they are online and what they are actually doing there. So, uh, both uh, we are now in the IP addressable category, but there is a very uh, big share in our life which we have no control over, and that is the convenience against uh, the security question in the case of uh, many devices around us. Now, uh, I would propose the following for NATO. And uh, I've also wrote an article which I'm, I'm sure, uh, Professor Snyder, you, you have it so you can share it to the class if you... We will distribute yeah. it. I um, yeah. had intended to do it ahead of time, but, you know, they distributed it to us on a uh, DVD and the computer I had with me didn't have a DVD player anymore. Uh, that, you know, that's almost outdated technology to read discs. So I promised the class we'd send sure. the paper out after the fact. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So uh, actually NATO has a cyber command of sorts for its own. So there is a NATO um, uh, computer incident response center, which is a technical center, a uh, group of techno technology experts who are tasked with the daily defense of the NATO's own networks. So they are uh, in charge of offering services, which you see highlighted on the screen. However, uh, well, this is not related to what NATO has been tasked to do by the heads of state and also by the strategic concept at large. So now I think NATO really needs to figure out uh, that a cyber command, a military cyber command, which is then jointly run by all the allies, should be established. Uh, there might be, of course, opposition to this idea for very practical reasons, but also for political reasons. But I would say that uh, the NATO command structure, that is the NCS, this is really the body which should have an institution like Cyber Command within it. Right, no, right now there is none. There are some uh, uh, service commands or component commands that deal with land warfare, Navy uh, and uh, uh, air issues. And there are also joint force commands. but. Uh, Although they all have cyber components to them, uh, I would say it's, uh, it would be good to have a joint approach uh, that really brings on and together all the expertise from those, uh, from those component commands or uh, why not in addition to them. So um, the NCS is by law, so by the NATO agreement, responsible for, for the three core tasks anyway, but uh, why it's really crucial to have a cyber command for NATO is the functions, the planning of operations, conduct of operations, and, uh, and uh, support functions, which the existing capacity under NSERC would, would not be doing. So the big question with the NATO cyber command should be if, should not be if, but uh, but how? So not if and when, but how? It's really uh, a capability that NATO needs to deliver on the heads of state's pledge. It will also enhance NATO's footprint. So it will uh, send out a signal that NATO really 
is doing something about the today's biggest challenge, I would say. It can be a uh, formal joint element by, by all the allies, or it can start as a coalition effort, so coalition of countries who are more into it. Uh, it can be under the Allied Command tr Transformation, or it can be under the, sh the Military Operations Command that is called the SHAPE. Uh, then the two models I uh, discussed, and one of the questions that the NATO Cyber Command would need to, of course, address is cooperation with like-minded NATO, non-NATO countries. Because uh, going back to one of the very first slides, cyber and the cyber threats, but also the cyber solutions, they are a global phenomenon. So there are like-minded nations who are not part of NATO, but who could really contribute to the joint effort. Maybe I'm uh, too optimistic, but for example, I, ha I haven't heard that uh, uh, Japan or South Korea is cyber attacking any Western nation. So I, I think there is a thus a basis for cooperation. And the bottom line being is that really you really need to get out the excellence from all the contributing countries, that is from the, from the whole alliance. One thing that we learn in Tallinn on a daily basis is really to have a multinational team on working on the joint challenges, uh, it's really helpful. It really br brings in the expertise, but it also brings in the network, that is the connections uh, to further capability in, your, in the other um, capitals. So we need to really act jointly to have a comprehensive approach. There's of course the question of uh, deterrence. So NATO is, uh, relies on the concept of deterrence. Uh, which essentially says you don't want to mess with us. So in the worst case, if, uh, if, anyone, uh, if anyone does anything on NATO, then the nuclear, nuclear option is, of course, on the table. Uh, is this achievable in cyber? Well, some people, some researchers say that, uh, well, in, in terms of cyber, it's not really about the mutually assured destruction, that is the idea of nuclear deterrence but it's about the mutually assured doubt. So the acronym is the same, but, uh, but uh, it means a totally a total different thing. So you don't know what the other side is capable on, of. In nuclear, you can assume that it will be, be total destruction for yourself. Uh, and uh, uh, some ideas which are expressed in regard to s cyber deterrence is that you know, having a joint mechanism, be it the cyber command or be another uh, like institution in place, sharing information between countries, it's already a, a sort of a deterrent. So you don't know what is out there. You multiply your capabilities when you do cooperation between countries. Also training. Uh, training is a key uh, element. It's, it's like a never-ending uh, competition. It's a race, race against the machines, if you will. Uh, and the more joint training uh, you are able to provide cross-borders to your allies, uh, I would say it's the more deterrent it is for the adversary. Also, interdisciplinarity is a key feature where you can build deterrence on. So you need to know not just the bits and bytes, but you also know, need to know the strategic <laughs> context and you need to know the law. Even if you don't uh, like what the law says, it's still important that you know and you don't engage yourself in, in some uh, bad deeds. Cooperation with the industry, very important. Most of the innovation in cyber defense is done uh, by private sector. So uh, that is where, uh, where the uh, I'll say next big things are. And you, if you're running a country, if you are uh, working uh, for your government, then you really need to understand what are the options, because eventually you might need those ideas to really defend yourself. Mind the gaps. Of course, uh, cyber can be everywhere, but there might be areas which it doesn't uh, really affect. Uh, also, you need to have in place uh, not just, uh, just the capability, but again, you need to ensure that, the, that whatever you, you possess as a capability in cyber, cyber security, cyber warfare, that it's also delineated with a national strategy, for example. 
And uh, last but not least, perhaps even most important, is the uh, difference on how countries around the world are conceptualizing deterrence. Uh, you may have heard the term hybrid warfare. Yes? No? So uh, hybrid warfare is a, uh, I'd say, a fairly new term which was coined in the context of the Ukraine war. And, uh, well, many strategists started speaking at, that the Russians are employing a hybrid tactics. So they are using uh, cyber means, but they are using also Kalashnikovs. They are using whatever. So uh, they are putting very different means into, into action. And it shouldn't surprise anyone well, that this uh, comprehensive approach or pursuing your national objectives with all the means that you have in your national toolbox. It's actually a very old concept that goes back to Sun Tzu in, in ancient China. Uh, and what uh, makes things even uh, more diverse is that the Russians are actually accusing the West of having employed hybrid tactics against them in the previous years. So it's really important to understand what, what you, uh, how you and how your adversary or the other countries conceptualize cyber and the cyber deterrence part of it. All right, so uh, that was then the law part. This is now the strategic context part. And you would uh, perhaps ask, so is anything being done about it? So at the center, we are uh, actually uh, arranging the world's biggest technical live fire cyber defense exercise. It's called Lock Shields. It's an annual event. On the map, you see the countries uh, with the blue dots who are playing in the exercise. So it's about 20 teams from, from Europe and the US. And the idea is uh, pretty simple. For uh, three days, there is a whole lot of hacking going on. Just uh, some fa facts and figures about the, uh, the event. So it's, it's really a uh, big thing. Uh, and altogether, we also have uh, some ad additional nations involved. What I mentioned about the information sharing with like-minded nations across the globe, we also have allowed uh, some like-minded nations to come and ob observe part of the exercise. And the other big thing I would like to just to remind you of, do you know who this guy is? Anyone? Yes, so that's Admiral Rogers, commander of the US Cyber Command. Uh, he has been a speaker at the conference. His pre predecessor was a speaker at the conference. Uh, it takes place uh, every summer, so normally the beginning of June. And uh, next year's event is from 31st of May. So I understand uh, and I know from experience that uh, it's a pretty tight schedule here in Syracuse when you study here. But if at all possible, please uh, do consider attending it. And uh, not just showing up, but th there is also a call for papers process involved. So actually it is, uh, as I like to say, if you write a good paper uh, for the conference, for next year's the, the process is already formally closed, but uh, if you act quick and send me an email, maybe we can work something out. Nevertheless, uh, if you write a good paper, you can uh, first get to have a live presentation by people like him, and you can also hope that people like him will listen to your paper. So it's really uh, a academic merit-based uh, conference that we're running in Tata, and it's op especially open to the academia and the uh, researchers from the academia. Okay, now the, I think the very last thing I would like to just inform you of is that uh, the center's website is a, has tons of information that you might find useful for your research. So I know you have to write course papers. Please feel free to check out our uh, website. We have several interesting projects which are open to public. For example, the Insider monitors what is happening in the international organizations. If something is being decided, then we uh, provide an uh, analysis on it, also register it, so it's an easy point of reference. 
national strategies. I uh, mentioned that uh, countries are around the world are getting their cyber sec security strategies uh, ready. Uh, whenever we get the news that the country has done it, we uh, again list it on our database, make it accessible if it is accessible. And we also provide an analysis, perhaps sometimes recommending what, what are the very good things about the new strategy. National organizational models. That is also quite interesting for those who would, uh, would like to know about how different countries around the world are solving their cyber security problems by national means. That is, which organization in, in a national setting does what, who is responsible for whom. I mentioned there is no one size, size fits all solution, uh, but it's still a useful place to, to how to say, uh, to look into when you, for example, are interested in drafting the ideal organization for cyber defense. And definitions. The very big problem with cyber security is that the definitions are different from country to country. So we have a project ongoing where we try to make our small contribution to this uh, uh, very challenging area as well. And this is then the NATO CCDCOE and everything I've been discussing with you in a nutshell. We have the uh, three core areas, the law, the strategy and the technology sides. We have the te technical exercises. We have the support to NATO. We have the Italian manual process and all the, the other academic research. And then in the middle of it all, we have the SICOM conference. And that concluded my presentation. I will be happy to take any questions. We would just ask if you have a question uh, when called upon to press the button on the microphone closest to you until it turns green um, so that it's captured in the recording. Um, while people are deciding, thank you so very much. Uh, I think not just the issues you addressed, but the interdisciplinary approach match what we're trying to do in this course so very, very well. Um, anyone? Sure, Brian. Sure, I'll go. Um, so I have a particular interest because I teach Russian politics at the Maxwell School. All right. You managed to get through a 45-minute talk and only say Russia two or three times, so I commend you for your restraint. But obviously, this <laughs> is uh, the big story in the news. So as someone who doesn't know anything about cyber other than what I read in the New York Times, one of the things that's curious about this, assuming the attributions that have been in the public are correct, is the seeming clear mistakes that were made by call the red team here, uh, that allowed the, their tracks to be uncovered fairly quickly by other players. So, I mean, so much so that some people have suggested that it couldn't have been the Russians because they wouldn't have been so stupid, right, um, to, to leave all these traces behind. Um, I'm actually quite willing to believe that people make mistakes all the time, but I, I'm curious if you can set, uh, shed any light on uh, both the techniques used and the techniques used to trying to identify who is behind the NT attacks and the related attacks that we've been learning about over the last few months? Uh, thanks, a very good question. Uh, I, would, I would, you know, just to shorten my response, I would really encourage you to read into the Thomas Reed article just yesterday. However, what, what you said about the uncovering of, of Russians, there is, um, I'd say, there's a claim that uh, like there were two cozy things. One was cozy beer and what the other. Yes, all right. Two beers, not two cozy. So, uh, like one of them uh, helped to re reveal the other. And for uh, my understanding, this was actually typical Russian, uh, I would say, uh, state agency modus operandi. It's it's not the first time where a where one Russian intelligence agency has revealed a uh, long-term operation of another, just by coincidence, just by human error. Uh, because uh, the, uh, what I alluded to is that you, know, you know, need to have inter interaction and uh, exchange uh, between countries. It's also obvious that the inside a country you would need to have better communication between authority, one authority to another. So 
agency cooperation is the key. And I would say that this example of the DNC Act, it was a clear un example on how in the Russian system uh, interagency cooperation really doesn't occur unless the Tsar upstairs tells them to. So, you know, it's, it's knowing about the history, uh, there is no, there is no, I would say, automated cooperation between agencies on the same level. It's a very hierarchical system and unless you're told to do that, you, you won't engage in sharing information. And uh, I, I would say it was uh, like a typical accident of that sort. One party stumbling over the other's ongoing operation and revealing it. So. Can I just add one thing, just for the audience? The Thomas Reed article is actually an Esquire, and his name is not spelled the way we normally think of Reed being spelled. It's R I D. So if you're yes, R I D. Online. Thanks. Yes, Esquire and, made it. Yes, exactly. And, and as a practical point as well, um, the two readings that were already assigned for next class are by the same person. Um, oh. <laughs> written some years ago. So for the class that has access to those, I'll try and send out the new one, and then vice versa for you. I'll try to send <laughs> you the ones that we use from uh, his prior works. Yeah, just a coincidence that uh, yeah. the same author that we'd already assigned for our next class. Oh, sorry. Sure. So we, we talked a lot yeah, about... Excuse me, probably best just to identify. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. from the class and by name. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, my name's Zach Lucas. Um, we talked a lot about uh, state-sponsored attacks um, and how there's the nuclear option of uh, we're mutually assured now, you just don't know what we can do. Um, how about when this starts concerning non-state actors, whether or not it could be an international terrorist organization or some of these hacking organizations that exist? Uh, what, what is the deterrence on these organizations that may or may not have as much to lose as, say, a state actor? Mm. Well, um from a social sciences perspective, you know, eventually every person on earth is a citizen of a particular country. So in an ideal world, you, you would be able to co contain a uh, threat by non-state actors by, um, by having the nation in question cooperate and uh, dissolve the, uh, the organization. It's interesting that you mentioned ISIS. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting case with ISIS. Uh, some time ago, uh, there were some cyber attacks uh, against a French TV station called uh, TV5 Monde. So it's TV5, essentially. And uh, their uh, screens were uh, blanked. They had, uh, you know, the ISIS symbolics displayed on them. And given that French, uh, France has uh, endured uh, several cyber attacks recently, uh, that was like, uh, uh, you know, a natural thing to assume that, oh my God, they are now doing this as well. So the ISIS is, you know, almighty all of a sudden. But uh, sometime later, actually, it has been speculated. It has not been publicly attributed to my knowledge, but it's been a speculation that uh, also in the case of this Tevez Sank attack, uh, some Russian... Um, special services may have their uh, involvement in. So uh, you need to consider what might be uh, the objectives of, of ISIS. So if they want to threaten people and create havoc, you know, terrorism has many faces, but uh, there are s you, you don't need to go onto one TV channel to create uh, chaos on the streets, not necessarily. So it's, you, can, you can opt for it, but you don't have to. At the same time, uh, if you want to, I'd say, push further on the achieved chaos, if you want to amplify that, uh, you don't actually need to be the first culprit. So you don't need to be the one who performed this, uh, the original terrorist attacks. You might be somebody who is vested, who has uh, vested interests in, uh, you know, showing France as a uh, society under threat, has vested interest in uh, drawing the French attention from international problems to national problems, to, for example, get uh, France less engaged in Syria, in solving the Syrian crisis or in solving the Ukraine crisis. 
So it's very speculative, but uh, it's an article I read about it uh, suggested that uh, although at first hand something looked, looked like a, a non-state actor, something performed by a non-state actor, it might actually have some uh, links to a, uh, a proper state. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's you know, difficult to, to, to deter individual citizens and uh, I think it's best uh, individual uh, you know, terrorists or individual players who want to stage something. But uh, I would say that the best solution is that nations really work together on them. So because eventually every terrorist is a citizen of a particular country. Is the okay. Talon Manual meant to address the application of international law in the cyber context just bet it between nation states or would it include um, non-state actors? Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't have the exact answer. Uh, let me check if it was on the list uh, because normally international law applies to relations between countries. Right. So I would say that, uh, uh, where was it? Ah, this one. Uh, you know, for example, the I was going to say, yeah. I, I think the original yeah. one w was operating under the assumption of like the UN Charter, it yeah. was nation state, and that's, yeah, having seen only little bits of the 2.0 version, I wasn't sure mm. what the focus is now. Yeah, well, the final, I haven't seen the final version yet, so okay. I don't have a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Probably going to follow off of what Professor Snyder said, but having the term the applicability, I think, of the laws of armed conflict to the cyber realm, how does Talon 2.0 or at least by extension perhaps NATO kind of rationalize the use of Article 5 powers, specifically towards uh, proportionality and distinction? And how do we hope to kind of translate that over into the per se regulation of international law where you have private actors in cyber espionage mm -hmm. where there is no clear line with aggressors and uh, defenders? Uh, well, I would say that for, for those situations exactly, you would need a joint effort. So you have one uh, point of reference which can then determine what is the best uh, solution to, to go, go after the culprit. Uh, in, uh, in the context of NATO and the Article 5, it's always up to a one ally. It n needs one ally to raise the question of uh, doing something about a situation uh, and then it needs to be decided collectively. So it might be that if something happens, you know, one ally is being, is being attacked, uh, and then uh, the victim raises the issue at NAC, it uh, might be decided that, you know, just another ally helps the stricken ally to overcome this problem, uh, because uh, for NATO, you know, might there might not be merit, there it might be a very slow process to get uh, a collective uh, response together. And it also can be tricky because in some cases uh, a problem exists and the solution is available by one, one ally and NATO politically will say nothing about it. So you just take care of the problem bilaterally and you don't need to have the uh, political uh, decision or the Article 5 declaration out there. So uh, despite NATO, well, it's been, it will be 70 years that NATO has existed soon. Uh, the Article 5 has only been used once, but the interesting case with it is that after 9-11, when Article 5 was declared, the only declaration of Article 5 in NATO's history followed a event where uh, civilians using civilian capabilities were attacking a civilian institution. And I think that actually is very relevant in the case of cyber. So you don't really need to use military force and to attack military objects to get Article 5 declared. Hi, I'd like to follow up with a question that fits in with what you're just commenting there because of the line between, you know, what's international and national and what's uh, uh, private sector 
and uh, state defense is, is obviously very, very blurry in this space. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering how far towards uh, regulation or a, a best practice promotion for nations uh, does, uh, does can, can NATO go? Because otherwise, uh, you know, we're just seeing from the Internet of Things attack from Friday, things are heading to get much worse. Over the next few years, we can sort of project with the growth in the number of IoT devices out there that are sort of open for attack. Uh, so is there, uh, how, be, what's a, is there a, a, any strategy, even, let's say even if you get your NATO Cyber Command Center, if on the private sector side things are going, getting worse and worse, aren't you always like perpetually behind in play, play, playing defense, I guess, without uh, absent uh, more cooperation back across uh, the nations on mm -hmm. the civilian side as well? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's one of the challenges for NATO that it's uh, by the by the broad publics it's seen as a you know military defensive mm -hmm. thing, so it doesn't uh, interfere with your daily life, so you don't you let it be out there. But uh, on the European side, actually, what is quite interesting perhaps is the is the role of the European Union. So actually, the European Union in in I would say in in the cyber developments. Uh, in general, it has lagged behind NATO, but now it's uh, gaining speed, so to say. It's getting new um, uh, st uh, strategy implemented, and there is a network information security directive, which actually is mandatory for all countries to um, to implement, to to follow. So there is uh, there will be a pretty harmonious cyber legislation in place the union wide uh, I guess perhaps what might be tricky will be then the countries who are not in the EU but who are in NATO and what do they make of all this but the EU is very much uh, about regulating uh, the normal daily life which which is outside the governance of, of NATO and uh, the directives and uh, new legislation will, of course, uh, implement and I influence what the uh, cooperation with the private sector will be about. Of course, NATO also has a thing called NICP or NATO Industry Cyber Partnership, but that is really geared towards practical delivery of, uh, you know, innovation and products. Uh, I would say the EU developments are uh, more broader in that regard, and we'll see where this leads to. One more. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a dual degree at the law um, and international relations. I'm related to your discussion about the mature and turned out. What are your What do you think are the projected concerns, biggest concerns in terms of cybersecurity threats? I mean, are we talking about debilitation of critical infrastructure? Is it intellectual property theft? I mean, what do you see in the future are going to be some of the biggest threats that nation states are concerned about? Uh, well, I would, s I would recommend that uh, nation states really uh, uh, engaged, and it builds on what I said just about the European Union, on establishing uh, clear uh, standards, uh, clear procedures for, uh, for uh, security of things. So not, not just uh, devices, but also networks, and, and also a standard for all countries to, to, to follow. So in terms of governance, uh, in terms of institutions, so who should be dealing with uh, the defense of the of the uh, the systems in in, in question? Uh, obviously, uh, it is always a, always tricky. Uh, the European Union hands are too short to cover uh, cover for the for the global reach of this uh, challenge. But uh, in terms of uh, threats, I would I would say that it you know it sounds like a huge problem, but it really boils down to very simple things sometimes. And one thing that we are uh, in Estonia, this is not now a NATO CCDCOE development, but it's a Estonian national thing, uh, is that uh, our uh, defense establishments, so all institutions under the Ministry of Defense, they are required to implement a program which is called the cyber hygiene. And it's really about uh, individual users being able to understand that whatever they are doing using uh, technology, using online services, that everything they do has a implication. 
and everything they do is actually uh, might cause harm to themselves, to the devices, but also to the whole uh, organization. And this program of cyber hygiene that is really focusing on the individual's uh, understanding of of the of the threats. For example, you know, if you have if you find a USB stick, so what do you do? <laughs> yeah, it might be you know. Sometimes these uh, occasions are even silly, but uh, sometimes they are. Uh, you know, occasionally I'm I'm surprised to meet people who are you know plugging one USB to another and and they don't realize there might be something wrong with it. Or another case was that uh, if you have a, like your smartphone, your, your you know, battery goes out and you go to your office and you want to charge it and all the plugs are full, so there are computers, printers, whatever, in, and then you see that your computer has a USB stick uh, uh, port. So you remove the, the, uh, the wall plug and you try to charge your uh, smart from, uh, smartphone from your uh, desktop computer. And we had one case where a user in our organization actually, uh, she was not aware of that actually if you have a smartphone and you connect it to the computer, it's not just voltages and not just power being moved in the, in the wire. But the device was you know, trying to update itself and uh, you know, somewhere the siren went off and you know, send in the cyber defense team and uh, unplug everything. And that's quite a havoc. <laughs>